Good evening. I'd like to thank you all and welcome you to our annual evening celebrating the Holocaust. If you sell, you, you don't celebrate it, but you do honor it. Um, we're going to get on with our program, but first um, we have only two dignitaries representing our elected officials. We have Andreas Villada, who will be representing the mayor, and our state senator, Don Hummison, who I hope is not sneaking out. <laughs> we also have his representative, Drew Redpro. Um, Andreas, do you have a citation to read? Do you want to? Uh, hi guys, I just want to say uh, it means a lot for uh, me to have y'all here um, and learn more about what happened in our history. I know that um, back in the in World War II, a lot of terrible things happened and this serves as a reminder for that not to happen again. Um, so on behalf of the mayor, I have a proclamation for Ms. Eva Sartori um, and he wrote, whereas the Holocaust was the state sponsored systematic persecution and annihilation of European Jewry by Nazi Germany and its collaboration, collaborators between 1933 and 1945. Six million Jews were murdered. Roma, gypsies, people with disabilities, and Poles were also targeted for destruction or decimation for racial, ethnic, or national reasons. And millions more, including homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, Soviet prisoners of war, and political dissidents also suffered grievous oppression and death under Nazi tyranny. And whereas the history of the Holocaust offers an opportunity to reflect on the moral responsibilities of individuals, societies, and governments, and whereas we, the people of the city of Holyoke, should always remember the terrible events of the Holocaust and remain vigilant against hatred, persecution, and tyranny. And whereas we, the people of the city of Holyoke, should actively read dedicate ourselves to the principles of individual freedom in a just society, and whereas the days of remembrance have been set aside for the people of the city of Holyoke to remember the victims of the Holocaust, as well as to reflect on the need for respect for all people. And now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Alex B. Morse, mayor of the city of Holyoke, do hereby proclaim and designate April 24, 2018 as Holocaust Commemoration Day in memory of the victims of the Holocaust, and in honor of the survivors, as well as the rescuers and liberators, and further proclaim that we, as the citizens of the city of Holyoke, should strive to overcome intolerance and indifference through learning and remembrance. In witness whereof, I have here and to set my hand and cause the official seal of the city of Holyoke to be affixed, and I'll give this to Ava. Thank you so much for coming to Holyoke and sharing with us your personal experience. It's a lot, it means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I should explain. Um, Alex is normally with us, but he recently lost his mother and there's a family affair this evening. Otherwise, he would be here. Um, I did say we have Don Hummerson also. Do you want to stand up and just, or you don't have anything to say, do you? No? And we have another loyal visitor with us also, Sister Mary Caritas. I don't know where she went, but, oh, I knew I saw you come in. Is there anybody I'm missing? Okay. I'm going to introduce um, Dolores Stein, who will have a few words for you. the Council for Human Understanding, the Holyoke Public Schools, Holyoke Community College, 
the Senior Center, I'd like to welcome you to Holyoke's annual Holocaust Remembrance Program, Yom HaShoah. As it is officially known, was established by the Israeli government in 1951 as an annual observance on the Hebrew date corresponding to the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, April 1943. This day has been set aside for remembering the victims of the Holocaust and for reminding mankind what can happen to civilized people when bigotry, hatred, and indifference reigns. In May, it will be 73 years since Allied troops went towards Berlin and it is the end of the World War II. They liberated the, the Nazi concentration camps. The horror that they saw was unbelievable for they lived through, the, they went through the camps and the people that lived there, of course, they knew what was going on. The starvation, the disease, the forced labor, and the torture, and the smoking crematories were their daily myst mystic uh, uh, happenings. The lessons of the Holocaust has become even more important considering the violence today around the world. That is why we are here tonight. There are those who claim that enough attention has been given to the, the millions who perish and that it is time for us to move on to the concerns of the living. If the world has grown weary of the mourning, is the answer that we will forget? Can we forget the, de the death of even one? Can we forget the death of all these people? We remember the fighters of the ghetto, the fortitude and the strength and the heroism of the many who gave their lives in the battle against the Nazi oppressors. Tonight we remember and honor the many Christians who at risk and sometimes at the cost of their own lives, help to rescue Jews from persecution and death. They were the righteous ones, whose actions were those of one who says, I am my brother's keeper. The world must always remember this catastrophe. That is why we are here tonight. Whoever sheltered or even simply assisted a Jew risked punishment. Only a few thousand Jews survived in Germany and Poland and were hidden in cellars, convents, and attics. They were hidden by citizens who were courageous and compassionate. They were the righteous ones. Over 5,000 communities, together with 6 million Jews, were wiped out by Nazi Germany in its savage war against the Jews and against Judaism. It is our sacred duty to memorialize the names of these communities. We must tell our children of it, let our children tell their children, and their children still another generation. We are here tonight so we can remember the memory of six million members of the Jewish people who died at the hands of the Nazis and collaborators. We are here so we may remember the families that were wiped out by the oppressors of the communities and the synagogues, the cultural, the educational, the religious institutions that were destroyed in an attempt to erase the name and the culture of the Jewish people. We are here tonight to remember the millions of non-Jews who were swept away in the Nazi nightmare. We must remember that no group, no individual can afford to ignore the lessons of history. Between 1933 and 45, Nazi Germany systematically persecuted and murdered millions of people with mental and physical handicaps, gypsies, 
homosexuals, Soviet prisoners of war, Jehovah Witnesses, and Jews. With time, survivors and children of survivors are disappearing, and with them, the living testimonies. We are witnessing Holocaust deniers making it difficult to eradicate the, the, the whole world about the Holocaust. We must be alert and aware for today. Thanks, there is, there is hate and discrimination all along with genocide in the world today. We are here tonight to remember the people and the role we have, to educate each generation to the fact that the human race must always stand united against racism and hate, regardless of who is made the target. We must not ignore evil or be indifferent to it just because it is aimed at someone else. That is why we are here tonight. Tonight we dedicate this program to remembering the Jewish children who lived under Nazi occupation between 1933 and 1945. Approximately one and a half million of these children perished during the Holocaust. Hundreds of children played important roles part of the, at the part of the Jewish resistance movement. Some wrote diaries that documented the atrocities committed against Jews by the Nazis and their collaborators. Some children secretly painted and drew images of these horrible conditions under which they lived in the ghettos and the concentration camps. Children also served as messengers and smugglers of food and clothing to people starving in the ghettos. The lives of so many children were brutally and unnecessarily cut short. Please remember with pride the important things that these children did to help others survive and the risks that they took in order to be part of the effort to fight against the Nazis and to help document the Holocaust. We are here tonight to remember these brave children. Will the Holocaust be remembered 50 or 100 years from now? Will it be taught? Will it be believed? For over 30 years, Holyoke has sponsored a Holocaust commemoration program, reminding us the way we are and with your support and caring, we can continue and help to ensure that the Holocaust is remembering, taught, and believed for years to come. That is why we are here tonight. We extend special thanks to the senior center here, to Neve and all her seniors for hosting uh, once again, this evening's program in this beautiful center. As always, we wish you and your wonderful seniors many years of good health, lots of happy occasions, and many hours of relaxation in this grand building. May you all go from strength to strength. Once again, our sincere thanks to the council, to the Holyoke Public Schools, to the Holyoke Community College and the Senior Center for their continuing and support of our annual Holocaust Commemoration Program. A special thanks to our committee, Gina Nelson, Bonnie Randall, Drew Renfer, Aaron Vega, Sue Panich, Cantor Yitzhak Barnoon, Mark Todd, Neve Rodriguez-Fenwick, Nicole Horton, Olivia Marzell, Nelson Lopez, Andreas Villada, and Don Hummison. We thank our patrons because without your help, we could not subsidize our programs. And a special thanks to Scott Stein and his family for sponsoring tonight's program in memory of their dad, Marty Stein. 
Thank you. Now I'd like to um, introduce you to our speaker for this evening, Eva Sartori. She was born in Poland and survived the war in Poland with the Russian partisan. They were Russian partisans and their job was to kill the German Nazis and sabotage the trains to support the war effort. After, after the war, her family returned to Poland and anti-Semitism was still prevalent in Poland and it was not a good place, and they weren't welcoming. It wasn't a good, uh, they went to a good place, and to Paris, and from six to 11 years old, and then she came to the United States and had her adventures, and I'll let you tell, her, I'll let her tell you about them. Um, I'd like to introduce Eva Sartori to you. Thank you. Can we do, can we do a relay with you? Because the choir is here. Can we get the choir and wait another few minutes? Sure. Thank you, Eva. We will introduce the school choir. I'm sorry there was a mess, mix up in our schedule. You're about to hear the best singing group in Western Massachusetts. These are our singing group, the Madrigal Choir from Holyoke High School under the direction of Mark Todd, who took a magic wand and turned this group into a wonderful singing group. And you're lucky to hear them tonight. I think, well, I don't need this. Um, I'll use my finger first. Um, the first piece we'd like to do for you this evening, there's four pieces. But the first one is How Long? The piece that we came in contact with a year ago um, was published in 2011. Just to read you just one set of lyrics from the beginning of this, which fits where we were our kids to do right now. How long, how long till this world is free from suffering? How long, how long till blessed peace will reign? How long, how long, till the power of love will come, and heaven's will is done. Several of verses, but that's our start, and this is what we're going to start with now. How long?
be over. <laughs> we're on the um, next piece. Um, you, you heard it last year, and you heard it the year before, and you'll hear it again because it's one of their favorites. Um, and it really gets the point across. It's called Elegy for Water. <laughs>
Mark, thank you very much. You're a good part of tonight, and we really appreciate the singers. Now, I've introduced her once. <laughs> in the meantime, we had one more dignitary come in, and that's from Holyoke, East Hampton's newest mayor, Nicole LaChapelle. I guess the other towns have to come to Holyoke to get their dignitaries. <laughs> I've introduced you once, so I will now invite you to the podium. We're happy to have you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here and happy to have had such a lovely introduction. That was wonderful. What a wonderful choir. So if you'll give, give me a minute, I will take out my script. Um, I'm here by a miracle, one of the many miracles in my life. It's a miracle that I survived the war, but a miracle that I'm here today because I had laryngitis till about 4.15 and uh, leaned on friends to substitute for me in case my voice didn't return. But it did at a quarter after four. <coughs> <coughs> so, 
So here I go. Uh, is it too loud? Too loud? Far away? Is that better? Okay, I'm going to talk probably for about, uh, thank you, for about 20 minutes and let you ask me questions afterwards uh, about details, if you want more details or more general questions. Thank you very much. Okay, when General Eisenhower found the victims of the death camps after the war, he ordered all possible photographs to be taken and for the German people from surrounding villages to be ushered through the camps and even made to bury the dead. Is that loud enough? Okay. Uh, in a letter to General George Marshall, he wrote, I quote, the things that I saw beggar description. The visual evidence and the verbal testimony of starvation, cruelty, and bestiality were so overpowering as to leave me a bit sick. In one room where there were piled up 20 or 30 naked men killed by starvation, General Patton would not even enter. He was supposed to be really tough. He said he would get sick if he did so. I made the visit deliberately in order to be in position to give firsthand evidence of these things if ever in the future there develops a tendency to charge these allegations merely to propaganda. These days we would say fake news. Six million Jews died in the Holocaust. Eisenhower was prescient. The urge to forget is strong. A recent poll in the US found that two thirds of millennials and fewer than half of the adults cannot identify Auschwitz, the largest extermination camp, or what happened in the extermination camp in which 1.1 million Jews were gassed. Recently, the Polish government has ruled that anyone writing that Poles were involved in the murder of Jews would be imprisoned for three years. Why not erase the whole thing from memory? Until now, I've been reluctant to speak about my personal experience of the 3,300,000 Jews living in Poland in 1939 when I was born, more than 2 million were killed. I'm among the youngest survivors, and therefore among the last. Even those who were teenagers during these years are dying. I am one of the few, few thousand Jewish children born in Poland who survived the war. I know it's critical that I shed my discomfort and bear witness to the events in which six million Jews and many Roma, homosexuals, handicapped, and other groups, over a million of them children, were labeled as biologically impure and, and killed. So how could such horrific events happen? Although we may never be able to understand the Holocaust, historians have advanced economic and cultural factors that triggered the rise of Nazi rule in Germany. After World War I, the Germans felt that the peace treaty ending World War I had been unfair to them. They were angry and humiliated by its terms. The depression of 1929 worsened living conditions and morale and allowed the far right Nazi party to overthrow a democratic government. The Nazis platform was based on the superiority of the Aryan race. In order, and in order to create a purely Aryan race, those groups considered inferior, subhuman, whatever you want it to be called, they had to be eliminated. 
only those of Aryan blood had a right to exist, and they needed more room in which to live. Nazis considered other groups other than Jews to be inferior, for example, the Slavs, but anti-Jewish feeling was their strongest prejudice and the elimination of Jews their most important goal. Anti-Semitism was an old and potent, is an old and potent prejudice in Western Europe, which the Catholic Church encouraged by preaching that Jews were Christ killers. Political factors were used to encourage anti-Semitism. In Germany, Jews were held responsible for the country's defeat in World War I, as well as for the spread of communist ideology. So by decree, as early as 1935 in Germany, and later in the countries they invaded, Jews were stripped of their citizenship for their right to work, their right to own property, Children were not allowed to go to school or to have non-Jewish friends. They weren't even allowed to walk on the sidewalk or go to the movies. Jew Jewish children were expelled from school and not allowed to fraternize with German children. But Jews were not, obviously, the Nazis' only target. Again, I repeat, there were other groups, gypsies, homosexuals, and the handicapped also had to go. In the need to create a Lebensraum, what they called Lebensraum, room for Germans to expand, in 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. A pact between Germany and Russia, the Molotov-Ribbentrop non-aggression pact, that lasted until 1941, divided the country into spheres of influence. The eastern part in which my family was lived, lived was under Soviet control until 1941. The western part was governed by the Nazis. So let me fill you in a little bit about my parents' background to illustrate the extent of prejudice against Jews in Europe. My father was born in Poland, but could not study medicine in that country because restrictive regulations permitted few Jews to be admitted to universities. At great financial sacrifice to his family, he went to Western Europe to study. He had hoped to, he, he received his medical degree from France, from the Université, Université de Strasbourg. He had hoped to remain in France, but returned to Poland in 1929 because his mother was dying. He tried to have his French diploma honored there, but it took years for him to pass a number of exams, including a high school exam and a medical exam before he could practice medicine. It also took a fair amount of bribery. Finally, he was allowed to practice medicine, but that was not the last time he had to go through this ordeal. He had to go through it again several times. My mother came from also a small, well, my father came from a big town, but my mother came from a small town, but she also had to go abroad to Czechoslovakia in her case to study pharmacy. In 1941, my family was living in Berezme, a town that had some uh, 3,000 Jews. My father practiced medicine, and my mother worked as a pharmacist in a local medical clinic. I was born in 1939, and my brother in 1940. Under the Soviets, our life was relatively peaceful. Though the Soviets harassed business and property owners, professionals were uh, essentially left alone. But the Germans invaded in 1942 and created a ghetto. That is an area in town, usually the least desirable, to which Jews were confined in unbelievably unhealthy conditions. They lived 
perhaps 5, 10, 15 to a room with little food or water. Not until 1942 did the extermination begin. A special killing unit, the Einsatzgruppen, arrived. They rounded up the Jews, took them in wagons driven by local Lithuanians to the nearby woods. They shot them and threw them into a trench that they had forced the Jews to dig previously. Fortunately, my parents had been allowed to live outside the ghetto. The night before what is called in German the Aktion, the roundup, my father had received a tip from a doctor in the clinic in which he worked that more Germans were coming. My mother's sister, who was visiting, convinced my parents that we should flee to the woods. The woods in Poland, especially in eastern Poland, are very dense. With nothing but clothes on their back and with two small children, one of whom could hardly walk, the three adults fled on foot into the unknown. They stopped at the houses of Poles they had known to ask for food and lodging, but were turned away by all. My mother had hoped to trade her shoes for bread, but the bread was not given and the shoes were not returned. The Poles took no chances. The penalty for Jews, for sheltering Jews, was death. To turn in a Jew, you got half a pound of butter. Sometime in their wandering in the dense surrounding forests, they met, they had some adventures, but then they finally met a group of Russian partisans, guerrilla fighters, who agreed to take them in. The Russians weren't eager to take in a group of bedraggled Jews with two small children. My small brother didn't help by screaming because he had lost his pacifier. The Russians were ready to do him in. Why they didn't, I don't know. Fortunately, they allowed us to stay because a doctor, as a doctor, my father would be useful to them. Many other Jews were rejected by them and formed their own groups or joined other Russian partisans. The forests were full of guerrilla fighters. Some were strictly Jewish groups, some, some were mixed. Um, somebody estimated that there were as many as 30,000 partisans, that's guerrilla fighters in the area. Our Russian unit consisted of NKVD soldiers. Now, that's the predecessor of the KGB. And it was organized along military lines with commands directly issued from Moscow. Moscow also sometimes sent airplanes that airdropped ammunition, food, and medications. Our detachment was under the command of General Dmitry Medvedev of the NKVD, the KGB. The number of people in the Atad, the detachment, varied. It could be as few as uh, several hundred or as many as 1,500 when other units were added. The units came, came and went. Some people cooked, some mended clothes, some cared for the wounded. My parents were part of a small medical unit that included a few young Jewish women who acted as nurses and provided other services. They had some equipment provided by Moscow and some medications. The main reason for the detachment's existence was to sabotage railway lines to gather intelligence and to assassinate Germans. This particular unit's mission was to support the activities of one Nikolai Kuznetsov, who disguised as a German officer was able to penetrate the German 
command in the nearby town of Rovno, which was a larger town, he managed to kill 11 high-ranking officers before he was unmasked and murdered. His heroism was acknowledged after the war with the title of Hero of the Soviet Republic, as was Medvedev, the commander of our unit. What was life like in the woods, you wonder? It wasn't as if we were camping or living in a woodsy suburban development. For shelter, we had dugouts covered with tree branches as camouflage. A small fire burned inside and went it, vented through a hole. Winter was harsh and we had few clothes. Shoes had to be improvised from tires or cardboard. These were the most prized possessions. Groups of partisans were sent out in wagons to nearby villages to steal food or requisition it from farmers at the point of a gun. Sometimes food was airdropped along with medications and weapons. Discipline was tight. Once, the commander ordered everyone to gather, including children, to watch the killing, killing of a partisan who had tried to steal meat. My father's duty was to care for the sick and wounded. I remember him amputating a soldier's gangrenous leg. He also treated uh, soldiers who had syphilis or gonorrhea with whatever primitive medications were available at that time, and he performed abortions when necessary. Sometime in the summer of 1943, a, plan, a plane landed in a nearby field. It brought supplies and was meant to evacuate the wounded to Moscow. Through the goodwill of a senior official, my mother, my brother, and I were allowed on the plane and flown back to civilization. My brother and I knew nothing about city life, and I remember being amazed at see seeing lights in the ceiling. I thought lights came, light came only from the ground. But a permit was, was required to live in Moscow, and my mother didn't have one. So she was sent to southern Russia, to the Caucasus, a train ride that took seven days. The region had recently been liberated from the Germans, but it was still a dangerous place for Jews. My mother finally moved and found work in a pharmacy in another town, but she couldn't keep her children with her. So my brother and I were placed in an orphanage. And unfortunately, separated from each other. My mother would come once a week and bring us a treat, maybe an orange. Small as I was, I ran away from the orphanage to find my mother several times. I said, I'd rather be killed by the Germans and be separated from my mother. We stayed there in the Caucasus for over a year until 1944, 1944 when my father was demobilized. He had, I can't even explain these circumstances, he had received a letter from my mother telling him where we were and so we, he managed to find us, and we were reunited. We were able to travel by train to Rovno, the larger town in the area in western Ukraine. Rovno had been Poland. I think now it's Ukraine. But anti-Semitism was not no unknown among the Russians. But although it hurt, it wasn't lethal. lethal. It was also rife in the Ukraine, in Rovno. When the chance came to return to Poland to go west, 
my parents took a cattle train to Lord Lodge, a large city that specialized in textiles. My father was employed in several factories, and we were more comfortable than we had been since the beginning of the war. My favorite game, mine and my brother, was to, uh, we, we had been given some toy German soldiers, a whole bunch of them, and our favorite game, which he played again and again, was to hang the German soldiers. However, anti-Semitism in Poland continued to be prevalent. Killings of Jews continued. Jews did not dare return to their pre-war villages for fear of being killed. The inhabitants feared that the Jews had come back to retrieve their possessions, which they had repossessed. We had been in Lodge less than a year when our apartment was vandalized. My parents decided they didn't want to remain in Poland. By chance, I think because my father was a physician, we were able to get on a Red Cross train that was going to Paris. So in 1946, we arrived in Paris knowing no one and with, with no resources. My father was the only person who spoke uh, French. But with the help of various Jewish organizations, um, the joint Tayas, we survived. We stayed there almost five years, during which my father wanted to get a French license, uh, even though he had a French diploma, was forced to repeat high school exams and medical exams. And he finally did. But just as he was uh, getting ready to set up uh, practice, our visa for the United States came. We had waited for it for five years. Our family in, uh, in the US had badgered pol politicians incessantly for five years until we were finally given a visa. As I come to the end of that part of the journey, I want to emphasize how brave were the Jews in resisting the Nazis, whether by revolting in concentration camps or by joining resistance groups. The survivors who managed to outwit the Germans or, for, or who fought them were also resistors. But even after the war, when we thought never again, prejudices of all kind remain, and genocide is taking place in various parts of the globe. I hope stories such as mine will inspire people to give aid and show compassion to victims of prejudice at home and abroad. Thank you. So my, my brother now lives in Belgium, or in France actually, moved to France, so he's happy there. Uh, can I answer any questions? Yes? Oh. Excuse me, I can't hear you. The Russian language, you know, I knew all these languages. For a while, I, sp I spoke only Russian among the partisans. And then when we went to Poland, I spoke only Polish. And now I speak neither. So that's too bad. But I just never, never heard them anymore. Never used them. Never learned to write in those languages. Uh, Yes, uh, uh, yes, yes. To Poland? Well, I guess um, Bovno was, I, I don't know if the Russians had actually annexed it then. It was the Ukraine. 
So uh, yeah, from Moscow, from the Caucasus, we went to Ogno, which is Ukraine, and from Ukraine we went to Poland. Feeling. What kind of feeling? Like, do you remember the adults, like when the war ended, do you remember that, that time, moment or that time? Um, and I don't, you know, I, I was pretty little. What I remember is my father coming to the orphanage and he carried a big watermelon. And I think one of the few Russian words I remember is arbus, which means watermelon. At the, at the end of the war, yeah, then we were reunited, even with my aunt, and I have no idea how, really, all mysteries. Yes, Bob? Uh, no, and I never will. No, it's a, it's a cemetery for me. I have nobody there, nobody to track down. Yes? During the war and after the war, there were no bad Nazis at all. No bad Germans. There were no bad Germans? I mean, they came through the war, changed the color, and they became part of the countryside or of the country. No one had people. There were many, many people, including the real reforms away. Depends for whom. It depends for whom. We were saved by the Russians. Notorious. forgot very quickly what they had been. But the business about being ashamed of the tattoo, when we came to the United States, we were very poor, had no money of any kind. My mother worked on the assembly line in Squibb. My father really had trouble finding a job. Right now, we sort of mythologize survivors, but in 1950, Nobody was talking about survivors. They were talking about all these poor Jews, which the United States really wasn't eager to have enter. So that's why it took five years for us to get a visa to come to the United States. Yes, sir. Where did you settle in the United States? Uh, my family settled in New Jersey where my mother, my family settled in New Jersey where my mother had an uncle. Her father's brother had left Poland 
early to escape uh, going into the army. And he was the one who um, sent us visas when we were in France. And his family badgered the congressmen and the senators from New Jersey. I have all that correspondence. Yeah. Nobody was eager to take in refugees, just like now. Nobody wants the refugees. Refugees are poor, but they also work hard. So anything else I can dredge up from my memory? Enough. Okay, well, thanks very, very much for listening. candlelight service now. Have you added me the list of people or are you going to call them up? Hmm? You go and light the candle. I got the light. candle lighting service now. And the first person to light a candle will be our speaker, Eva. Eva, would you light a candle, please? This candle is in memory of the helpless infants, the children and the teenagers who were cut down like young trees before their time, before they had a chance to experience life. We shall not forget them. Andreas Philatus. mothers who died with the children in their arms. We shall not forget them. Sister Mary Caritas. In memory of all the mothers and fathers who were cruelly separated from their families, we shall not forget them. The Reverend Marissa Eggleston. In memory of all scholars, teachers, rabbis, who were the first to be taken, we shall not forget. Nelson Lopez. In memory of the heroes of the resistance who fought the Nazis, so few against so many, we shall not forget. Henny Lewin. 
in memory of the martyrs who gave their lives to help their brothers under the Nazis. We shall not forget. Mark Todd. In memory of the righteous Gentiles who risked their lives to save the lives of Jews and many others, we shall not forget. Senator Don Hammerston. In memory of all the non-Jewish men, women, and children who were liquidated too. And in memory of the men, women, and children who perished in 9-11, Bosnia, Yemen, Africa, Afghanistan, Syria, we shall not forget them. Another student, please come up and light a candle. These are very special students. in honor of our brave men and women who have fought and died in Iraq and all over the world. We shall not forget them. I believe in God and the world to come. When each one of us comes before the millions who were killed, we will be asked, what did we do with our lives? One will say that he became a teacher, another became a doctor, another became a watchmaker, and another might say he became a tailor. But we will be able to say, we did not forget you. That is why we are here tonight. We've been here for over 30 years, and we will continue, and only if you help us by coming. We thank everyone who was involved in planning this, and we should only have happy occasions to come to. Safe home journey. Thank you.